Hi there. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name's Andrew Henley. I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, our programming for this evening. And so we have a um, program that I thought could be interesting. So uh, when was this photograph taken? And so um, this is going to be a live demonstration kind of of uh, the research that goes into uh, finding the um, item as well as the items, uh, the item's provenance as well as whenever it was uh, taken. I know that we might have a lot of pieces within our collections personally that we would want to kind of know about the age or date in which it was taken and that's kind of what we're going to be discussing tonight as we dive deeply into when this photograph was taken. Now the photograph that you see there, I'm going to pull it up larger later this evening, but this is a photograph that I do have identified. Um, her name was Lizzie Henley Bostick, or excuse me, yeah, Lizzie Eva Henley Bostick. And um, she actually uh, was from Texas. And she was a uh, she has an interesting story, and we'll dive deeper into it later this um, in this uh, episode. But let's just say she was the. It has something to do with a brothel, Texas, and a funeral home, and so uh, again, a very very interesting story um, that we have for you this evening. But um, let's go ahead and uh, give a premise of kind of what we're going to be doing, and so. As I said, a lot of times we have these pieces and we want to dive more deeply into um, learning about them. So again, I just wanted to introduce myself. If you're joining us for the first time, welcome. If you're joining us again, thank you. Um, I received my undergrad at Westminster College as I studied a bachelor's in history and now I'm currently working on my master's in library information science from the University of Pittsburgh. And um, we... Uh, we focus a lot on data and uh, searching and different things such as that. And so um, this is a right up the alley for this is how we can really find this information. I am the founder and president of um, Pleasant Hill Historians. Um, I'm currently working on becoming a certified genealogist as well as uh, I do a lot of historical research. Um, and so I, I think that's kind of where we're going at it. And uh, I want to, I dedicate my life to history and education. I always say this because um, the, uh, at the Historical Society, we've been honored to partner with them on the development of the Civil War series with myself leading it. I am happy to say that I've been with the Historical Society for um, a number of years now. And the Civil War series has really taken off um, and we're looking at um, the struggles of um, what we're doing this year for the Civil War series. Um, and then as we go through, um, there are two other pieces here that I've developed locally. But um, we do a lot of research related to um, educational pieces in the, in the county, um, as well as for other counties as well. Um, not really limited. And so... Um, as I go through this this evening, I don't know how long it's going to take, but I can tell you a little bit about the individual. But um, I, I was working through one of these similar, and I want to um, dive a little into it and see how see what you think about um, how we can go about this research. So first things first, the photograph. So here is the photograph of Lizzie. And um, what's interesting about this is that um, it is signed by the artist, well, uh, the photographer, B.G. Grundle, and then it says Round Rock, Texas. And so, you know, I always do a quick search. So let me open up another page. Round Rock, Texas. Let's see where it is. So the city of Round Rock, Texas. It's outside of Austin, Texas. And looks like it was um, a Chisholm Trail crossing. So it was part of the Chisholm Trail, which was a 
I, I actually had to look this up because I recognized the name, but I wasn't sure exactly what. So it was a passage that actually went through um, Round Rock, Texas, and it um, it was started by a um, let me I'll pull it up so I don't misquote it. So the Chisholm Trail. Here we go. So it um, was established by Black Beaver, a Lenape Del Delaware guide and rancher, and his friend Jesse Chisholm, uh, a merchant. And so this trail ran from Texas all the way into Oklahoma, and it was a cattle trail that went through. But it went through Round Rock, Texas. And so as I look at this a little further, um, let's go ahead and go to the Wikipedia page. Just to get like a general knowledge of the area, so it is right down here in outside of Austin in Williamson County. Um, and then as we go through, just some quick pieces, 19th century history, talking about Jesse Chisholm, talking about the Chisholm Trail, talking about um, the different uh, pieces that were grown within the area, and then the Old Settlers Association, Civil War, impact, of that okay so now we have a quick understanding of kind of the area and why it was important or what what was happening there here's the rock that it says that it's named after it's round and if you were surprised <laughs> um thought that was cool so uh let's go into lizzie now i it was identified on the reverse unfortunately it wasn't captured within this so lizzie uh, Lizzie here, I did some research beforehand. She is actually my first cousin three times removed. But um, I don't know if this is 100% accurate on her death. I know that, or on her birth. I know that we have, um, I can actually see. Oh, I guess that it does showcase that. So I can see here a little bit about her through her Texas death certificate. So she was widowed, Lizzie Eva Bostick. Died in Hutto, Texas. George, father George Henley, born in England. Mother Jane Robinson, born in Ohio. Signature Riley. She was the, or this was the um, witness to the death, or to the death. But it does say kind of where she was born as. Let think maybe I'm missing something but um, it would say sometimes here's her date of birth but it doesn't say exactly where she was born within this document so let's go into another one well what we're looking at though um, I'll dive out a little bit there's all these rabbit holes we can look into so I have her being uh, born 1864 died 1942 so we know that this photograph was taken when she was alive so let's start with 1864 to um, 1942. And so then we can look at it. We know that she's probably older than 16. So let's revise it. Um, older than 16. And I would say that she's younger then I would say younger than 55 just as a quick quick idea so let's see 60, 1864 plus 16 so you're looking at 1870 1880 and then you're looking at um, younger than 55 so 55 minus 42 is 13 1900 minus 13 is, oh, excuse me, I was incorrect in that adding. So let's look at it. I'm just going to pull out calculator. 1865, 4, plus 55. So now we have it between um, 1880 and 1919, because 1864 or plus um 55 is 1919, and 1864 plus 16 is 1880. So now we have kind of a general knowledge of how old she might be within this picture. 
Now, what we also have is kind of her residences, but, you know, it does say that she was in Williamson, Texas in 1880, according to the census. She says she was in Missouri um, in 1870, but Williamson, you know, I, she could have come through earlier than that. Here's her marriage. So we do have her marriage license. So 1884, she was married to a William Talaferio Bostic, Talaferro Bostic. Um, and then it continues, let's see, death of her father. These are just some pieces that I have, but a lot of times you might not have this information to go off of. But there's one other piece here, that B, G, Grundle. So let's see, now that we have B.G. Grundle. Let's do B.G. Grundle, Round Rock, Texas. Who was B.G. Grundle? Okay, so here is here are some pieces. There's a Brauer Gustav Grundle. There's a YouTube video. And let's go ahead and click on this real quick and see a little bit about B.G. Grundle. Rock, Texas could play an important role in the history of Lindsborg. That church convention was attended by Bethany College President Dr. Carl Aaron Swenson and a young Swedish-born photographer, Brewer Gustav Grundahl. Swenson was so impressed with the young photographer, he invited him to Lindsborg. Grundahl was born in Vesteros, Sweden in 1855, one of 11 children. After his father's death, his mother moved the family to Uppsala, where she thought the children would receive a better education. Not so for the restless young Roar. His mother bought him a round-trip ticket to the U.S., and he headed for work in the orange groves of Florida. He was 14 years old when he left Sweden. Young Grundahl worked in the groves and then in a sawmill. While in Florida, he contracted yellow fever. His doctor suggested the best cure for the disease would be a sea voyage, so Grundahl signed on to work on a clipper ship sailing to many parts of the world. As a young worker adventurer, Grundahl never liked to sail on the same ship twice. He was fascinated by the sea and changed ships often, eventually landing in Chicago where he worked on the wharf. It was in Chicago Grundahl became interested in photography and went on to apprentice with a photographer in St. Paul, Minnesota. Once he had developed confidence in his skills, he headed for a warmer climate the Swedish settlement of Round Rock, Texas. There he met an attractive young photographer named Sarah Noyd, who was already in business. The two photographers became friends, then courted and married. By 1886, their photographic business was well underway when Carl Aaron Swenson attended that faithful church convention. Swenson was enthusiastic about Grundahl's work and convinced the young couple to come to Lindsborg. They agreed to try it for a year. That year grew into a lifetime. The Grundahl settled into a house in the 400 block on North Main and raised their family in the small Swedish community. Grundahl established his Lindsborg studio in 1887 and is remembered to this day for his meticulous craftsmanship and his rare ability to capture personalities on film. Grundahl developed a special friendship with Dr. Swenson, was an enthusiastic supporter of the college, an avid sports fan, and active in local politics. When presidential candidate Teddy Roosevelt came to Lindsborg, it was Grundahl who organized a community supper for him. Grundahl never forgot the adventures of his youth, often sharing sea stories and sailor songs with his children and grandchildren. Grundahl maintained his studio on Main Street into his 90s. He died in 1948. So that was really interesting. It gave you a quick understanding. It did say this is the correct guy. So um, what I was able to take from it is that he was only in Round Rock, Texas for a short period of time. So we have to figure out when was he in Round Rock, Texas. So here's a um, looks like a blog talking about um, um, Mr. Grundle, and so it 
says here, there's um, a picture that was also taken in that studio in Round Rock, Texas. So, um, but this was whenever it was with another photographer. The piece that we have just has himself. So let's continue to read through this. Round Rock, Texas, 1887. Um, it's the, whenever he was in Round Rock, Texas, he married, um, and go into photography. They both went into photography together, he and his wife. And so 1887 is when he starts. Um, and it says a news item says the Grundle Gallery is near ready to open in May 20th, 1887. Here, May 1889, Round Rock, Texas. The son of Mr. Grundle is born. And then we're looking at July, June, July, Georgetown, Round Rock, Texas, based in newspaper items. And then we see here some other pieces. Poor children to Grundle in Kansas. So by 1893, he's already in Kansas. But then here, 1891, he's in Kansas. Does this say news item that says that Grundle has returned from Texas? Um, and the ad saying that um, the Grundle was still in Lindsburg, Kansas up through May 1889. So it might be assumed that he was in Round Rock, Texas during June, July of 1889. So it's looking as though around 1889 and 1891, um, they moved back to Kansas. But whenever he's down in, um, in uh, Round Rock, Texas, it's between 1887 and that 1891 conservatively. So 1887 to 1891. So right now, we've actually narrowed it down from just the age of, here, Lizzie Eva Bostick. So that was her age. And then we have kind of um, what she looks like, older than 16, younger than 55. Um, and that gave us a general area to look at. But now we're down to only four years. So we've narrowed this photograph down now from a whole lifespan of the individual, which when she died, she was 78. So we've narrowed it from um, 78 years to um, around 29 years or 39 years to now just four years. And so, you know, a, a great piece is now, um, let's go back to this and kind of see a little bit about um, the photographer still. Maybe we can narrow it down even further. There's a picture of him. So here are some of his studio pieces that he had. Oh, look here. So it's uh, this here is a um, photograph, and the footer is the same footer as the um, photograph that we have. So let's see kind of what... Um, what we might have. I don't know who this Anne Lind is, but let's see if there's anything else relating to that. Some examples on this page have been enhanced. Sometimes you can even find the um, individual that's featured within it, and then we can do another analysis on the age of that individual and when they lived. So that's some, another way to do it. But what I'm trying to find is, has returned from Texas and opened his gallery. So this does give us a date, 1889. He has returned from Texas and opened his photograph gallery. So I can narrow this to 1889. I'm comfortable doing that. So now we're down to two years. 
So the arrangements of the photograph gallery is nearly completed before um, Mr. Long, before long Mr. Grundall will be prepared to do work. So um, this shows, excuse me, that was inaccurate. So a lot of this might be trial and error. You want to make sure that you're narrowing it down appropriately when you're um, finding this information. Let's see if there's another piece. B.G. Grundle, Round Rock, Texas. And what we can always do Okay, so there's B.G. Grundle right here. And I'm just reading through this really quickly to see if it mentions anything about when his studio was operational. There's the video we just watched, which was very informative. Now this isn't really showing much with respect to that. What I might go ahead and do, now there's other ways to, other than this simple Google searching, you might find some stuff, you might not. Um, oh, here's a nice piece. BG Grundall, Round Rock, Texas. Okay, so the date of the original here, 1883 to 1885. So then we have it, him in 1883 to 1885. But that's just an estimation. That's an interesting contradiction. I'm just going to put that in here as a citation. So 1883 to 1891. And then what the purpose of this is, is that this item is stating that um, the original, this piece, was photographed between 1883 and 1885, which contradicts the blog article that was originally given as 18, um, 1887 or 18, yeah, 1887 to 1891. And I'm just going to put this in. It's always good to have citations instead of you questioning yourself, where did I find that information again? And then you might not have that source to uh, directly relate. Um, now let's see if there are any other photographs that we can look at. A website that I use sometimes is called dp.la, it's Digital Public Libraries of America. And what this does is it actually partners together um, some repositories all across the United States that are able, you're able to view uh, some of these photographs and some of the objects that are within the repository. So you can see these are photographs taken from the Minnesota Historical Society. And so um, I can open this one. And so here he is in Kansas in 1890. Now he could have had both studios going and he could have gone back and forth, but from what we've read just recently, he was already moving to Kansas around 1889 to 1890 to 1891. There was some flexibility in there because this was where it was 1889 to 1891. So I'm just going to put 1889 to 1891. So now we have, oops. Now we have um, some pieces that we can look at. Nothing's really showing that same footer. Um, another website that we can really use, I've used Ancestry a few times, so let's go ahead and see what we can. Um, now, it, a lot of times when you're accessing this information, you might have to have an Ancestry account to begin with. Now, his name was, just going to copy and paste it. Raul Gustav Grundall. And we know that he was born 
1855. And this was in Sweden, but we're just going to look for the records relating to him in the United States. So there he is on um, Find a Grave. Find a Grave might offer some more details, um, but you have to understand that some a lot of this information is dependent upon who is entering it. And so we always have to have our hats on to question um, the accuracy of some of these pieces. So it doesn't look like he has a biography in this, which kind of would make sense. But what we can see is his children, this Edith Carlson, it says it, she was born 1887, doesn't give us the location. And then we're looking at 1889, also doesn't give us the location, but we can always look that up. Um, what I'm going to do real quick is I can pull up family trees that are, these are trees that are accessible to the public that um, people have op made them accessible to the public. You can always check your privacy settings on your tree to really uh, determine whether or not um, you have these, your tree is publicly accessible or not. So I can look this individual up. It looks like, I'm just going to pull Carlson. So it looks like he's, this individual has done a lot of work related to his family. Nothing's really showcasing that Gustav as a direct descendant, but that doesn't mean that it can't be a, a piece. Okay, so Elaine, you had question, couldn't you try to look up a marriage record of the wedding um, couple for a date? So I do have a date here. 1887. Now, 1887, I think that's when they had said that in Round Rock, Texas, this is where they were married. And then they went into photography together. Now, if that's the case, then I have him opening the studio in 1887 after the marriage. But that's where I question this date, 1883. Since this item here from utsa.edu um, says that the photograph was taken between 1883 and it actually didn't give us an end date, but 1883, 1885. And it doesn't say that he was working there at that time. Um, or he didn't, doesn't say he was in the photography business at that time. Now, the marriage, nothing, no record. Oh, here we have the 1900 census. So in 1900, he was already in Kansas. So that's accurate per what these pieces are, are signifying. Now, one thing that we have to recognize is that the 1890 census actually burned, so most of it we don't have. Um, let's see. What I'm going to do, I'm going to go to a different tree to see if there's any information relating to him. You have to be careful using trees sometimes because, as I said, they're not always accurate. They, a lot of times, they, the individuals putting the information in, and we hope that they put in accurate information, but it's not always the case. So let's see. As we go through this, and if you're just joining us now, we're, what we're doing, we are actually looking up this photograph, um, and we're trying to come up with the date of which the photograph was taken. And we've um, narrowed it down by um, Lizzie Eva Bostic. That's who's pictured here. Her um, birth and death date, and then we've narrowed it down even further. She was older then 16 in this photo, younger than 55, hypothetically, which proved to be accurate because B.G. Grundall was only there in Round Rock, Texas from 1887 to around 
well, or it could be 1883 to around 1891. Our sources are actually contradicting each other. So what I've done sometimes is actually, let's see, Round Rock, Texas directories. Now what directories are, um, these are uh, typically a listing of all of the businesses that are in that town. Um, and it can list the the um, the businesses and their addresses on a, a given street. So let's see, Round Rock, Texas directories. I'm just going to lay this down a bit. So what I'm trying to do is, we can even type in maybe William, oh, here we go. Library Archives in Round Rock, Texas. Let's see, oh, okay, so it's not pulling up exactly what I was anticipating. What we can always try is, we show a picture of a couple on their wedding day that has the same frame as Lizzie, yeah. So let's look at that photo again, this one here. So the example, this photograph currently does not have a, um, a name associated with it. But what I can do, let's go to google.com and we're just going to do images. And we're going to do search by image, upload that image going to see if it's posted anywhere else on um, online and so I think it's just searching from vintage clothing but no, nothing's really showing up that that specific image is seen there now what I've done I, Google has the opportunity we can upload an image and search by that image there's the image itself um, but nothing really is coming up that uh, quickly identifies this image. Another way we can do it, we can go to eBay <laughs> um, and type in that same BG Grundle. Photograph. Sometimes they come up, sometimes they don't. So that doesn't look like things are coming up. I'm just going to type in Grundle. Mm -mm. BG Grundle. Photographer. Let's see. Here's another book. Granddaughter writes a book about um, her father, grandfather. So this does talk about B.G. Grundle. This is in a McPherson Sentinel. Uh, look at all these ads. Okay, let's see. <laughs> um, okay. Answer this survey to continue reading the content. Okay, how appealing would you rate Utah as a travel destination. Let's just go with uh, slightly appealing. Um, okay, thank you. Now time to read. So it's the book is called Through the Lens of B.G. Grundle, Keeper of His Time. Just going to quickly bookmark that. No, it's not really saying here. The two successfully ran the studio together until 1887. So Grundle moved to a nearby community to open his studio, but a friendship, then romantic relationship grew between the two photographers. The two married October 19th, 1886. There's that date we were looking for, Elaine. Um, and so then it says the two successfully ran the studio in Round Rock together until 1887 when the couple met Carl Svensson the president of Bethany College. Svensson um, asked the couple to move to Lindsberg to help grow the college and the community. 
Sarah agreed to move for one year. However, once settled in Lindsberg, the couple, couple never left. So what we're looking at, that they started in business together in 1887, but he did have his business in play beforehand. So that those dates or con conflicts between those dates are being seen in this description as well. Let's go into the book and see what we can find. And um, here's a, something from the Library of Congress. So the book is there. Um, let me go archives.org. I think what I'm trying to do is go to um, online archives. It's archive, not archives. And so what I'm trying to see is if this book, if this book is out of print, which it's not, or it's not listed there. So sometimes some of these are more difficult than. Uh, what you first anticipate, but um, it's uh, I think it's a nice challenge for anyone to really go through. Um, and so as we are going through it, there are some times that we find uh, it to be a little more difficult. Oh, this is a point. So Mr. Grundle moved his family to a small Kansas community in 1887. There's the, um, the date that they moved there. So I think that it's, um, it is that 1887 date rather than the 1883 date. Although I know that that photograph contradicted it. Um, and then after a lifetime, Mr. Grundle's photography remains significant and vital. Hmm. So what we're trying to find is a little more, actually, let me pull that citation before I navigate away from it. So I'm going to pull this up here. It's a little smaller. Okay, so as we go through, if you're just joining us again, I just wanted to quickly review what we are, what we've been doing. This is the photograph that we're trying to navigate and dive more deeply into for when it was taken. We know it was of Lizzie Eva Henley Bostick. Her maiden name was Henley. Um, she was older than 16, younger than 55, just from what we believe is to be her perception, or um, unless she just aged well, um, that's kind of what we thought. So we narrowed it down to 1880 to 18, 1919. And then um, B.G. Grundle, that's the photographer pictured here. So we've narrowed it to a set of dates, but give and take a few, uh, this is about seven years or less that we've narrowed it down to. Um, but what we're trying to find right now, it does say that he had his studio um, whenever they uh, opened it. They moved down to Round Rock and in 1887. And so um, they ran the studio in Round Rock until 1887 when the couple met Carl Svensson. Um, but now when they're moving away, that's where a lot of uh, confusion comes into play. There was this one photo that really listed them, but I have not found another one just yet. I'm just going to put um, that citation in as well. And so let me see if I can find other cabinet cards. Um, 
Grendel. Now it's such an interesting name that I think that um, you're going to find uh, a couple pieces related to him. Here's about the Kansas Historical Society. Um, this is, these are different collections. It looks like there are photographs that were taken by him. Um, these photographs, uh, let me see if I can, uh, Kansas memory, okay. So these were taken in Lindsburg. But I can see here, I can pick on the, uh, the name itself. See what I can find, Grendel. Okay, so more pieces are really showing up here. Now what I'm on, it's called Kansas Memory. This is news. It's a Kansas Historical Society's online portal that I can really dive a little more deeply into it. Um, okay, let's open this. Okay, so off the back, this is the front. Lindsburg, Kansas. So this was taken between 1887 and 1890. Um, talking a little bit more about the individuals pictured here, rather than, uh, it's an interesting picture, rather than what we're looking for. And as we are going through it, you know, I'm, I'm always on the search. We can continue searching until the day you have to really identify what, uh, what your stopping point is going to be. Um, but it's always a, a quick, nice search. Let's look at the state archives. So Texas State Archives. Now, understanding that he was only in Texas for a short period of time, we might not find anything related to it, but it doesn't hurt. Uh, to look. So G-R-U, G-R-O-N, I hope I spelled it right in the previous site, G-R-O-N-D-A-L, yep. Nothing there. Let me make sure I spelled it, spelled it correctly here. Grundle. Yeah, I think it's the same piece here. Uh, no, it does mention Carl Svensson here. No, that's a little too late. Now, we also know he was in Williamson County, Texas archives. And so let us see we can find anything relating to Williamson County Archives. We could do Williamson County Historical Society. See if they have a historical society there. Texas. It was related to the Williamson County. There's a historical commission. Genealogy. Okay. That might help. We can do a surname search. Grundle. Nothing. Um, BG. Do Grundle. Round Rock. Texas. Now there's another piece here. Kansas Gen Web. So this does give a little biography here. Here's a little piece. Okay, so on October 21st, 1886 at Round Rock, Texas, Mr. Grundle married Miss Sarah Noy. Mrs. Grundle is a Swedish percentage um, and was born in Illinois, February 4th, 1859. Seven children have been born. Um, now, it doesn't really say Edith graduated at Lindsburg. Doesn't say where they were born, because if their children were born there, that could be another piece. It did say that in the previous piece. 
It says, upon leaving uh, the sea, he came inland and moved to Chicago for a number of years. While he was a grocery salesman for five years, then took up the study of photography. Mr. Grunzel worked under guidance of some experts in the arts of the city um, and later employed for three years in some of the best studios in St. Paul, Minnesota. For four years, he had his own studio at different cities in Texas. And in 1887, he came to Lindsberg and owned an, op an op excuse me, and opened a studio which he he, um, which he has conducted now for 30 years. His proficiency is of the highest quality. Some years ago, Mr. Grundle erected the building. Okay, so what we're looking at, I'm going to say that it's, I'm comfortable in saying in 1887, he moved up to um, Kansas, um, in Lindsburg, Kansas. And so that would leave us at a hard cutoff in 1887. Hmm. That's a challenge. You know, these pieces don't really jive which is throwing me off. Now this is a... That's when they marry and then they move. So we're looking at this even uh, before deciding to go to a warmer climate. Let's see the dates of some of these pieces. Okay, I'm going to... Uh, dive into newspaper archives real quick and just uh, see a quick piece. And we're going to look for a um, individual, Mr. Grundall. Let's revise it. B. G. Grundle. Here we go. Lindsberg photographer. This 18, 1943. I think this is his obituary. is 88 years old, but he's at a studio daily. Nope, this isn't his obituary. It just says that he's still working at 88. Okay, so let's see what else we can find. Rockford, Illinois, B.G. Grendel, 1905, 1936, 1946. Is the oldest businessman and has announced something. Let's look at this real quick. Here. And so it's the oldest businessman has announced the sale of his photography studio. He established in, oh, what's that say? Established in 1886. So he did establish his studio in Lindsburg, Kansas in 1886. That's another source that we've really defined. Um, so that would, <laughs> that would end it at 1886-87, which is another contradiction to some of the pieces that we found. Now, a lot of these times, you know, what we're trying to do, um, and if you're just joining us, we really tried to narrow this down, and we've got it to around three to four years. I know we're getting almost to an hour, so <laughs> um, this is sometimes when you have to put it down and say, this is this is as far as I can get. Um, but as I go through it, I might play around with it later this evening, see how far I can get, um, and see how how to really go about um, go about finding more information about B.G. Grendel. I don't think I'm going to find more information about Lizzie. Um, she was primarily in Hutto, Texas. Here's the ending of his story, if you're still with us. Um, so Lizzie owned and operated a brothel, which also operated as a funeral home in Hutto, Texas. Um, her and her siblings, um, now they never really had children, and so they all um, died without any descendants, and that's all the descendants of George Henley here. Um, and so 
really, really fascinating story. Um, Annie Riley Henley and James William Henley, they owned a potato chip factory in Hutto, Texas as well. Um, and so it's a really um, cool story, uh, unique to say the least, but uh, they were featured in an Arcadia publication, their potato chip factory was featured. And so it it's played an interesting part. Um, and I'd have to say, uh, whenever I uh, look up this Lizzie Bostick um, Henley, it's, you know, I, I always question some of the pieces that, <laughs> that surround it um, when we look at, um, here, here we go, this is it. So it talked a little bit about Lizzie down here. L.E. Bostick and his wife, Lizzie Henley Bostick, owned a funeral parlor furnishing a two-horse drawn wagon, coffin, and double-filled procession walking behind its deceased final resting place. Lizzie's brother and sister, Will and Riley, sold good luck potato chips, mixed sodas, raspas, and outdoor uh, theater and restaurant. And um, I know that I also read here that it was a brothel. Maybe it wasn't this one, but there was one. And a really, really interesting story. Um, but so as I go through this, uh, I'm going to go ahead and just hit pause um, and say that's, that's about all we can do right now. So we've really narrowed it down. I'm going to put 1883. And most of the sources did say um, 18... Uh, Comfortably, 1889 um, is when everything ceased. Um, 1887, there was a lot of sources around that. So um, actually, what I can do, I have my um, database here. And I can um, just pull that into it. So let's pull it into it. And we can scroll down to Lizzie Henley Bostick and we've identified this as uh, 1883 to 1891 and we know that this is now not Crondat but Grundall and so that's a it's kind of a little sample of the research that goes into finding um, more information about the the how this, when was this photograph taken? Be much easier if they wrote the dates on the back, but uh, unfortunately we don't have that within a lot of these. And so we have to do a lot of research to find that, that specific date. Um, and so as I did last week, um, I like to feature a nonprofit that I, I assist. Um, this is another one of my friends. Um, she started it recently. Her name is Dr. Jessica Patton. Um, she has developed and um, we have a nonprofit that's focused on sensory learning called Sense of Connection. Um, what Sense of Connection is really focused on is providing to rural communities with uh, people that might have intellectual disabilities um, that to provide them sensory equipment, um, especially during this time, you're finding that a lot of students are, um, a lot of people are um, having trouble um, changing this life, uh, the, the lifestyle into a uh, at home learning and being inside a lot. Um, and so sensory items such as this, as well as within our education is a major point that I think that sense of connection can really benefit from. What uh, the studies are that really back this was that Dr. Jessica Patton did her thesis um, or, or her dissertation on um, looking at rural, rural communities and how rural communities might not have the same um, ability, uh, access to um, the financial means to acquire some of these sensory tools. Um, and so I, I really do support them. Um, they do have a Facebook. So if you're on Facebook, um, please go to it. It's a sense of connection. Um, and you can find it on Facebook. That was the logo that you saw. Uh, yesterday, we did celebrate World Autism Awareness Day. And so uh, 
check it out. Uh, there, the last thing I saw a post on here, I wanted to share it with you all um, while I have a captive audience, um, that they've established a connection with uh, Fun and Function, and um, we want to, uh, here we are, to show appreciation for the first responders during this difficult time, Fun and Function is offering a special discount. We recognize that many first responders have their own children at home who may need additional support during this crisis. If you are a first responder who may benefit from, a fun and, from any of the Fun and Functions products, please message us or reach out to Dr. Jessica Patton uh, directly. Um, they are here for us and we are here for them. And so if you do know anyone, share it, send it to them, and uh, uh, we can really, they can really um, benefit from this connection, that sense of connection has made. Huh, connection. So um, again, thank you for joining us this evening. Next Friday, we're going to pick a different topic, see what um, see what comes out of it, um, and uh, you're welcome to review the other ones that we've done um, and uh, see if you have any questions, message uh, the account at Pleasant Hill Historians, or you can email me at info at phhist.com, or you can follow us at www.phhist.com. Uh, we have a blog article that's run monthly, and you'll see our next one coming out on Monday. Uh, check it out. It's a really interesting piece on West Africa, specifically Timbuktu. So if you know Timbuktu from your childhood, never wanting to be sent there, um, take, <laughs> to check it out. And um, I know that it'd be an interesting story in today's light. Um, so thank you again for joining us, and I hope you learned something today. If you find out exactly when this photograph was taken, just message me and I'll be able to update it. Thank you once again for joining us.